اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ضروري ہے اللهم صل على اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ایک چھوٹی سی دعا ہے جوہر بھائی سب کے لیے ارشاد اے رب جہاں پنجتن پاک کا صدقہ اس قوم کا دامن غم شبیر سے بھر دے اے رب جہاں پنجتن پاک کا صدقہ اس قوم کا دامن غم شبیر سے بھر دے بچوں کو عطا کر علی اصغر کا تبسم بوڑھوں کو حبیب ابن مظاہر کی نظر دے کم سن کو ملے ولولے اون و محمد ہر ایک جوان کو علی اکبر کا جگر دے ارے ماہوں کو سکھا سانیے زہرہ کا سلیقہ بہنوں کو سکینہ کی دعاوں کا سر دے جو چادر زینب کی عزا دار ہے مولا محفوظ رہے ایسی خواتین کے پردے مولا تجھے زینب کی اسیری کی قسم ہے بے جرم اسیروں کو رہائی کی خبر دے اور جو دین کے کام آئے وہ اولاد عطا کر جو مجلس شبی کی خاطر ہو وہ گھر دے اے رب جہاں سید سجاد کا صدقہ بیمار جو ہو ان کو مکمل تو شفا دے مومن پہ ذرو لالو جواہر کی ہو بارش مقروض کا ہر قرض خدا غیب سے کر دے اور غم کوئی نہ ہو ہم کو سوائے غم شبیر شبیر کا غم با رہا ہے تو ادھر دے اے رب جہاں پنجتن پاک کا صدقہ اس قوم کا دامن غم شبیر سے بھر دے سلوات اللہم صلی اللہ محمد وعالیم نام رکھ حسنی قبلہ تعالی موسیقی فور ہی سریز آف لیکچر فی دس رمضان باوہ زبران سلوات اللہم صلی اللہ محمد وعالیم محمد
Please recite Surah Fatih for your Marumin, for the Marumin who provide for tonight's iftar, and for all of those Mu'minin, Mu'minat, Marumin that do not have anyone to recite Surah Fatih on their behalf. Allahumma <laughs> ولا يناله غوص الفتن الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نات موجود ولا وقت محدود ولا جل ممدود فترى الخلائق بقدرته ونشرياه برحمته وتد بالصخر ما دام عرض ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وحبيبنا وحبيب رب العالمين بالقاسم محمد <coughs> وَعَلَىٰ أَهْلِ بَيْتِهِ الطَّيِّبِينَ الطَّاهِرِينَ وَاللَّعَنْ عَلَىٰ أَدَائِهِمْ أَجْمَئِينَ مِنَ أَوَّلِ يَوْمِ ظُلْمِهِمْ إِلَىٰ قِيَامِ يَوْمِ الدِّينِ أما بعد فقال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المبين وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا ترفعوا أسواتكم فوق صوت النبي ولا تجهروا الله بالقول كجهر بعضكم لبعض أن تحبط عمالكم وأنتم لا تشعرون صدق الله في الليل One of the most important aspects of morals it deals with the way we interact with other people. And when you look at the lives of the Masumin, you see that they interacted with people differently based on who they were, how they were. What do I mean? When they realized that the person in front of them could handle more knowledge, when they realized that the person in front of them was able to hold more knowledge, they would give them more knowledge. When they realized that the person in front of them could not understand what they were saying, they would try to explain it as best as they could. But as you're all aware, in a gathering, you're going to have people that can understand. You're going to have people that will not understand. You're going to have people that need a more further explanation. Even when the Quran was being revealed, what would the people do? There were Arabs. The Qur'an was revealed in the Arabic language. There would be times when the Holy Prophet would give his sermon and the Arabs that are listening to the Holy Prophet, when they would leave from that place, they would ask others, what did the Prophet just say? They would, they would, say, they would ask other people around them, what did the Prophet just say? The language that the Prophet is speaking is Arabic. It's your tongue, yet what the Prophet is saying, you don't understand and you're asking others about what is happening and what was said. So it tells you that even in the time of the Holy Prophet, the fact that others, who are these others? All of these have seen the Prophet. All of these have recited the Kalima. All of these are living with the Prophet. All of these are, con all of these are supposed to be Muslims, correct? But at the same time, all of these are Ashab. All of these are Ashab that are in front of the Holy Prophet, correct? When the Ashab themselves, some of the Ashab themselves are telling others, what did the Holy Prophet say? When they're asking other Ashab, what did the Holy Prophet say? What did the Holy Prophet mean? Then how can you say that all of the Ashab were at the same level? When it came to the understanding, the narrations themselves, they say that no, they were not at the same level. Some understood better, some did not understand. The ones that did not understand, they were asked the people that did understand. Now we have Muslims that say, no, all of the Ashab, they're all at the same level. How? In any community, you look at the lives of any prophet, you look at the lives of, forget the prophets, you look at the lives of people in any community, whatever community that an individual lives in, 
Is everyone in that community educated the same? Do they have the same education? Take, take the, any, any community. Is and everyone in the community all going to be PhDs? No. no. Are they all going to have masters? No. You'll have different levels of people who have different amount of education. In the time of the Holy Prophet, there were companions that could not even write. There were companions who could not read and write. Correct? So how are they all the same? How are they all the same? What will they say? Well, the Holy Prophet could not read. No, the Holy Prophet could read and write. There's a difference between not reading and not writing and not being able to read and not being able to write. Just because I don't read what's on here, does that mean that I can't read? I don't know how to read? No. Amir al-Mu'mineen himself, he says, may the curse of Allah be upon those people that believe that the Holy Prophet could not read and write. Why did they start saying that? Why? Because some of the elders that they believe in, they could not read and write. So what would happen? They, come, they said that the Holy Prophet could not read and write. But when it comes to the way we interact with people, even the Holy Prophet, he interacted with the people different ways. He got mad sometimes. Yes, he got angry. There were times when he got angry. To think that the Holy Prophet did not get angry and he was always smiling is absolutely wrong. It's absolutely wrong. The Imams, yes, they got angry. It's not that they were always just smiling. No. Good akhlaq. What does good akhlaq mean? Good akhlaq means that you have, if it's time for you to be happy and it's time for you to smile, you smile. When it's time for you to get angry, you get angry. When it's time for you to be sad, you're sad. That's what good akhlaq means. So when it was time to get angry, the imams, the holy prophet, they got angry. For example, it's the last few days of the Holy Prophet. It's basically when the Holy Prophet, he asked Usama to lead the army. The last, the last days of the Holy Prophet's life. He's asked Usama to take army and move, leave Medina for, for battle. And he's told everyone that's in Medina. I want everyone to join the army of Usama. Everyone except for Ali. Correct? He's told them one time. He's constantly asking, has the army of Osama left? Has the army of Osama left? He gets a reply, no. Why? Because the companions, they're taking their time. What does the Holy Prophet do? He goes on the mimbar and he says, may the lanet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on anyone that does not join the army of Osama. Not once. Not twice, but he said it three times. May the lanet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on anyone that does not join the army of Usama. So sending lanet is something that the Holy Prophet did from this member. Sending la'an. He did it from the member. Who did he send it on? Those people that did not join the army of Usama, if the Holy Prophet did it, then it should be allowed for us to do also. So then no one should get angry if we sent lanet on those people that did not join the army of Usama. The Holy Prophet would get mad. The Holy Prophet would be happy. So the way he interacted with people would be different. The way you, in, you and I interact with people we need to keep that in mind. In the sense that the person that we're speaking to, if it's a religious matter, maybe they don't understand the religion the same way you do yet. Maybe the level you're at is higher than them. Or sometimes it's the other way around. Where we don't know much about the religion, but when someone comes and tells us or informs us a little bit of, about the religion, what do we do? We get angry. Who are you to tell me about my religion? I know better than you. I know better than you, exactly. Who are you to tell me? I know better than you. I know. 
Sometimes what do the elders do? They'll look at the youngster and they'll be, who are you? You, you? You were born yesterday. I've been Muslim for 60 years. You were born yesterday. What do you know? Elders, sometimes they do that. And when it comes to this type of a clock, this type of a clock is not the clock of the Ahlul Bayt. You have to remember, right is right, wrong is wrong. But, but, there's a way to tell someone that what they're doing is wrong. And that's what a lot of people lack. When someone sees someone doing that something that is un-Islamic, the way you tell them has an effect on them. The way you tell them. If someone is doing something wrong and you want to let them know and you're very strict about it, hey, what are you doing? What you're doing is absolutely wrong. Stop doing this. If you have this type of tone, what are they going to do? They're going to get mad at you and tell you, who are you to tell me? But if you approach them from a different angle and you ask them, hey, you're doing this. Why is it that you're doing this this way? Or why is it that you're doing this? If you approach them in a calm manner, in a calm demeanor, they'll reply to you in a calm manner, in a calm demeanor. The way you approach them has an effect on that individual. You don't want them to be repelled from Islam. You don't want them to be repelled from getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want them to get closer or want to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one of the reasons. This verse that I started this lecture off with, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this verse to the believers, what did he say? Ya la tarfa nabi. O you who believe, do not raise your voice over the voice of Rasulullah. Do not raise your voice over the voice of Nabi. It goes on to say what? And do not speak loud to him as you speak loud to each other. This is Surah Al-Hujarat. Surah Al-Hujarat, it has so many moral lessons that you can derive from it. But this is Surah Al-Hujarat. What is it saying? It says, do not speak loud to him as you speak loud to each other. Lest your deeds become void. Meaning what? Meaning that if you speak loudly to the Holy Prophet the way that you speak loudly to each other, your deeds will become void and you don't even know. You don't even know. So one of the things that this verse tells us or commands us to do is to speak to the Holy Prophet what? Loudly? No. It's commanding us. It's telling us that we are not allowed to speak to the Holy Prophet in a loud voice. What was the reason for the revelation of this verse? Uh, to go to the reason in the Tafasir, it says that when all of these uh, tribes, they were coming and they wanted to become Muslim, there came a point where Abu Bakr and Umar they were arguing over who was going to be uh, who was going to be the uh, for Banu Tamim, who was going to tell the Banu Tamim that yes, you know, the Holy Prophet's here uh, and this is the Prophet, he, he's, uh, this is the message that he's bringing. Abu Bakr, Umar, they were arguing over who should be that person to go invite them. <laughs> and it got to a point where they started raising their voice, started the narration, they said that they started cursing at each other. It got to that point that they were actually cursing at each other. Because one wanted one, obviously one wanted one, the other one wanted themselves to be that person to go invite them. Because of such an honor, Banu Tamim is a huge tribe, it was a famous tribe. Such an honor to be that person to invite them to Islam. So it got to a point where they start raising their voice or the voices, they start cursing at each other. When they start cursing at each other, that's when this verse was revealed. This verse is revealed regarding who? Two of the companions, namely Abu Bakr and Umar. Was this verse revealed <clears throat> in a positive tone or was it revealed in a negative tone? In a negative tone. What is this verse saying? Specifically for those two people. If you raise your voice over the voice of the Holy Prophet, all of your good deeds have been 
gone. It's basically threatening the individuals. These verses that have been revealed as a threat, these aren't revealed in a sense of goodness. No, these are revealed to give, put fear in that individual. To put fear in that individual. So these verses were revealed for that. When Aisha started raising a hoot, raising a holler, when Imam Hassan al he was being taken, after, after Imam Hassan al he was martyred, his casket was being taken to be buried next to Rasulullah. And when it was being taken to be buried next to Rasulullah, that's when Aisha, she starts screaming and yelling that I don't want him to be buried next to Rasulullah. I don't want him to be buried next to Rasulullah. She starts screaming, she starts yelling. When she starts screaming, she starts yelling. Imam Hussein al-Islam at that time, he recites these same verses. This same, this same verse of Surah Hujat, where it's telling the individuals that do not raise your voice over the voice of the Prophet. Do not raise your voice over the voice of the Prophet because if you do, then your deeds will be completely gone. So when these individuals have raised their voice, Imam Hussein Islam has basically said what? That because you've raised your voice this much, your deeds have been gone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that because you too have raised your voice this much, your deeds have been gone. When both of these, both of these two, when their deeds were gone, then how can they be rightly guided Khalifas? Then how can you then claim that these are rightly guided Khalifas? Tell me, for the Islamic Ummah, was she the only wife of the Holy Prophet? No. Did the Holy Prophet not leave other wives? He did. So why did the majority of Islamic Ummah just stick to one wife? Why? This is the injustice. They say what? The, all the wives are equal. All the wives are equal. How many narrations do you have from other wives of the Holy Prophet? All the companions are equal. All the How many narrations do you have in Bukhari from Amir al-Mu'mineen? And how many narrations do you have from Abu Huraira? Amir al-Mu'mineen from Mecca to Medina to the end of the Holy Prophet's life. All that time. Yet when you look at Bukhari, no more than 500. No more than 600 narration from Amir al-Mu'mineen. When you look at Bukhari, Abu Huraira, how many years did he spend with the Holy Prophet? Do you all know? Do you all know? N less than, about, less than four years, about three years maximum. That's it. Three years. And Bukhari is filled with thousands of narrations from him. Thousands. There's more narrations from him than there are from Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr, he spent more time with the Holy Prophet. There are more narrations from him than it is from Umar. And what? Umar spent more time with the Holy Prophet. Why? This is the injustice that becomes that happens in Islam because of Banu Maya. But when it comes to the way we talk to people, I need to get back on this topic because this is a very important topic. The way we interact with other mu'mineen should not be the same way that we interact with other Muslims. Should not be the same way that we interact with non-Muslims. Should not be the same way that we interact with people that do not even have a religion. What do I mean? What I mean is that the smaller the circle becomes, the more respect that individual is due. The smaller the circle becomes. Meaning what? Meaning you have all of mankind. They're due, they're due that respect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered for all of mankind. Correct? But then when you come within mankind... You have people that believe in a God 
And you have people that don't believe in a God, correct? The people that believe in a God, they have some more rights. Now, from the people that do believe in a God, then you have what? The non-Muslims. Those non-Muslims, they have more rights. Correct? From those non-Muslims, you gave them their rights. Now, you have the Muslims, they're given their due rights. Within Muslims, you have what? Mominin. They're due their right. Within the Mominin, then what will you have? Your closest friends, they have more rights. Outside of your friends, what will you have? Your family, they have more rights. Then you come down to your parents, they have more rights. The smaller the circle becomes, the more rights the individual ends up happening. The more rights that individual is supposed to be given. And right now we're looking at Muminin. I'm not going to the family. I'm not going into the family. Because Sili Rahim itself is a topic of its own. And many people do not practice Sili Rahim even though they should. And what does Sili Rahim mean? And when, when is the only time when Qatay Rahim is allowed? Because it's not as if Sili Rahim is 24-7. No, there are times when Qatay Rahim, it becomes necessary to do. But when it comes to interacting with individuals... You see that the way we interact with our boss is not the same way that we'll interact with our friends. Correct? When we're interacting with Allah, when we're interacting with our boss, first and foremost, let's look at how we act. When we get up in the morning, what do we do? When we need to go to work, we'll put on the best clothes. Correct? We might put on cologne to smell nice. We'll put on the best clothes. We'll smell nice. We'll look our best when we're going to work. We'll look our best. We'll smell our best. And when we're, when we're at work, what will we do? The speech that we have when we talk to our boss, it will not be the same as the type of speech that we'll use when we're talking to our friends. Correct? Even our speech, it becomes more what? It's, it's more fluent. It's less chaotic. Meaning, if I was to talk openly, when we're speaking with our friends, we're so open, we don't have a problem cursing. Correct? Yeah. We'll throw curse words, whatever. But when we're at work, no. Now we're conscious of what? the place we're in, we're conscious of what? The person that's there. We take all this into consideration when we're at work, when we're in the press, or we know that the boss is over there. Why don't we take that same amount of time, put that same amount of effort when it's time for prayer? When it's time for prayer. The amount of concentration that we'll have at work, we don't have that amount of concentration when it comes to prayer. We don't have that amount of concentration when we're in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example. Shouldn't we have more? Yes. Why? Because this is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This, you're in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you're praying. He's the one when you ask, He gives you. He opens up all the doors. So when you know for a fact that He opens up all the doors, then would you not want to go to Him looking your best? <clears throat> and showing Him. Ya Allah, one thing Amir al-Mu'minin, He says, look, there's one thing people sh should do. And it's not considered to be showing off. The ni'mat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you, Amir al says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to see it on you. <laughs> loves to see it on you. Meaning what? <coughs> Meaning, if he's giving you enough wealth, 
If he's giving you enough wealth, he wants you to spend that wealth in a halal way. He wants you to spend that wealth in a halal way. Meaning, you have wealth, but you have about seven family members. You have a good amount of wealth, you have seven family members. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants what? He's giving you wealth. He wants to see that every one of those family members is living comfortably, even if it's one house. Meaning what? Meaning buy a house big enough where everyone can live comfortably. Where everyone lives comfortably. Or the other way, what some people do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them wealth. But it's seven people, they're in one bedroom. For what? A companion of Amir al he came to Amir al-Mu'mineen. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Nasi Balava, he came to Amir al-Mu'mineen, complained to him. Ya Ali, my brother, he's left everything. What He goes, what do you mean he's left everything? He goes, he just, he's left his family, he just goes to, uh, outside into the desert, into the jungles, and all he wants to do is ibadat. <laughs> Amir al goes, okay, let's go see him. He goes and he asks him, your brother says this about you, is this true? And the man, he says, Ya Ali, yes, that's true. And he goes, why? He's telling me that you start, you start wearing coarse clothes all of a sudden. He goes, yes, why? Ya Ali, you do it. Imam Ali alayhi salam, everyone, everyone has this image of Imam Ali alayhi salam that he used to wear coarse clothes, Correct? He used to wear very, in the sense that his clothes that he used to wear, especially his kurta, it had about 30 places where he had sewn it together. The man, he goes, Ya Ali, look at you. You're dressed like that. So what's wrong if I dress like that? What's wrong if I dress like that? I mean, moment he gets angry at him. He says, look, the reason I'm dressed like this is why? It's because I'm in charge of people. I'm in charge of people. I am the center figure of Islam. I'm dressed the way the, lo the, way the poorest person under my rulership is. Why? So that poorest person can look at me and say, look, the person who rules over me is dressed like me. The person who rules over me is dressed like me, so why should I be worried? That's why I'm dressed like this. Who do you rule over? He stays quiet. There's another time. He goes to one person's house. Amir Mumi looks around. It's a very, very beautiful, elegant house. Amir Mumi, he looks around and he says to him, if only you had built a house like this in Akhira. If only you had built a house like this in Akhira. He goes to another person's house and he sees the state, the family's in, and he looks at the house and he looks at the person and he goes, why are this many people in this small house? Why don't you use the money that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you to build something better for them? To build something better. What is Amir al doing? This person has wealth, but he's decided not to use it for the family. He's decided not to use it for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made wajib. What he's doing is just saving it. Saving it, saving it, saving it. Amir al gets mad at him. Who is he? He's a Shia of Amir al -Mumini. The other person, Amir al does not tell him that, why did you make a house this big? No, he doesn't. He doesn't. All he says to him was what? If only the house in Jannat for you was also this big. If only you would make yourself a house this big in Jannat. What is he telling him? How, do you, how would you make houses in Jannat for yourself? Through Ibadat. Through Ibadat. Amir al muminin is basically telling him what? That you're lacking in your Ibadat. Increase it so the house in Jannat for you will be this big. That's what Amir al muminin is teaching him. But how do you and I get to that level? Or how do we get that understanding? Because so many ulama will come and they'll tell you about the imams being this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. 
in the sense that the Imam, for example, Imam Ali, he would never eat. He, he didn't eat um, bread that was made out of wheat. Narration, that's what the narration state. He didn't eat bread that was made out of wheat. The bread that he would eat would be out of barley. Correct. Has anyone said the way Imam Hassan used to dress? Did Imam Hassan dress the same way Imam Ali dressed? Did Imam Hussein dress the same way Imam Ali dressed? Did Imam Zain al Abidin? Did Imam Jafar Sadiq? Why? Was there something wrong? Is there a contradiction between that? They're all Imams too. Why didn't they? It's simple. I had said it five minutes ago. The reason Amir al was dressed that way was why? Because he was the leader of the Islamic Ummah. Did Imam Hassan al Islam have that leadership? For six months, that's it. Did Imam Hussein al Islam have that leadership? No. Imam Zinab, no. That's why the narration state that when the 12th Imam comes, he's going to dress like Amir al Mu'minin. Meaning what? Meaning that he's going to look at the poorest person under his kingdom and he's going to dress as the poorest person. He's going to dress as the poorest person. So if the poorest person in his kingdom, if the poorest person in his kingdom was a millionaire, he would also wear those clothes that that millionaire is wearing. If the poorest person was a millionaire. No, but if the poorest person does not even have any food to eat, then he's going to dress like that person. He's going to dress like that person. That's the reason. All the other imams, they used to wear, wear very beautiful clothes. To the point where Imam Hassan al Islam, he's coming on his horse. There's Yahudi, he sees Imam Hassan al Islam on the horse and he sees the fans, the nice clothes that he's wearing. And he looks at Imam Hassan and he says, Yabna Rasulullah, you all say that this is a jail for the Mu'mineen and this is heaven for non Muslims. But look at you. Look at the way you're dressed. Look at the ride that you have. And look at me. This non this Jewish person, what he did was he, he would just till the land. And his clothes were dirty. His his face because of working all day. He goes, Look at you and look at me. Look at you and look at me. Imam Hassan al Islam, he tells him that when you see my reality, when you see my reality. In that time, then you will come to truly know that yes, this world truly was a jail for me. For me, Imam Hassan, he says that you'll come to truly know that this world was truly a jail for me. And when you see your reality in that afterlife, you'll finally come to realize that this world was truly a heaven for you. This what I'm wearing right now, it's still jail for me. It's still jail for me. Having a nice house, having a nice ride, having nice clothes is not un-Islamic. Please. Having all these nice things is not un-Islamic. But what could be un-Islamic is how you acquired them. That's it. If you acquired all of this in a halal manner, this is tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you acquired all of this in a haram manner, all of this will be on your neck, around your neck on the day of judgment. This is something for everyone to think about. The wajibat, not the namaz, not the, no. The qums that needs to be given, are we giving it? The zakat that needs to be given, are we giving it? And I believe, before we forget, zakat al-fitrah. Should I make that announcement? 
fifteen dollars. They're saying fifteen dollars is going to be zakat al fitra this year, um, and we still have a couple of days. But just remember that you cannot make the niyat that this is zakat al fitra until when? Until the night of the moon, until the moon night. If you want to just leave some money aside, you can leave it aside, but you can't do niyat that this is zakat al fitra yet. Okay, if you want to leave some money aside, you can leave it aside, but you can't do niyat that this is zakat al fitr. There's a reason for that because it could be possible that the night of you might have some guests, and it might be possible that you have to pay for that guest also. But zakat wajib, homes wajib. Are we giving these wajibat? Because you have to remember that specifically these two wajibat. What was the reason that they were incorpor incorporated into Islam? Zakat is for who? Khums is for who? Is it not for the poor of the community members? Whether they're sadat, non-sadat? Yes. Khums is the haq, is the right of the Ahlul Bayt. It's the right of the Ahlul Bayt. Zakat is the right of everyone else that truly requires it. When you don't give that right, do you think the fast that we've done in this month will be accepted? No. And the narrations, they talk about Zakat al-Fitra. The fast that we've done, they were just hanging in the sky until Zakat al-Fitra is paid. Once Zakat al-Fitra is paid, then they get taken up to the heavens. Once Zakat al-Fitra, Why? <laughs> Why is that? What was the reason for these fasts? It's so that you and I or the rich people in the community can feel the same type of hunger that the poorest person feels. Yes or no? This was, this was one of the reasons. Where the rich people in the community, they can feel the same hunger that the poorest. In. So if the poorest is eating one time a day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the richest also to eat one time of day so they can understand the poorest in the community. Correct? That's one of the reasons that siyam, fasting, has been prescribed. With zakat al-fitra, what's supposed to happen? That happiness that these rich in the community, they see, with that zakat al-fitra, that poorest of the community should also see. Should also see. Wherever, wherever the zakat goes. But this religion, brothers and sisters, this religion is a whole chain. From the time we wake up in the morning to the time we go back to sleep at night. Everything is linked. If one piece of that chain is broken or one piece of that chain has a crack, or one piece of that chain is soft, what's going to happen to the whole chain? It's going to be brittle. It's going to easily crack. It's going to easily break. It's going to easily break. So that's why every single link needs to be strong. You don't just look at your ibadat, or you don't look at your relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No. This Islamic chain is not just your relation to Allah, you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, this Islamic chain also has your relation to your community members. Your relation to your community members. One of the reasons, for example, Friday prayers was necessary, was why? So everyone in the community can get together and find out, hey, do you need something from me? Is there anything I can do? Do you need any financial assistance? This was one of the reasons. But many of us, we forget this. We just want to come for our namaz, do our namaz, even though within Shia fiqh, it's not wajib until the appearance of Imam Zaman. We do our prayers, that's between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when it comes to us and the other mu'mineen, no. when in reality, it's our duty to ask the other mu'mineen, do you need anything? Can I do anything for you? No matter how small it is, it doesn't need to be money. No, it doesn't need to be money. 
I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He keeps us on this path of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He forgives our sins, that He forgives the sins of all of those marhumin, mu'minin, mu'minat that do not have anyone to ask for forgiveness on their behalf. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the real prince of Imam Zaman. Let us, our families, and anyone that's willing to sacrifice their life for him and his cause be able to sacrifice their life for him and his cause. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Please, once again, brothers and sisters, recite Surah Fatiha for your marhumin and for the marhumin of all of those that provided for tonight's iftar. Do we have any time? We have, huh? we, have to have five minutes. we have five minutes. Do you guys have any questions? If there's no questions, then please um, wuzu and then get ready for Salat al Maghribain. No questions. MashaAllah, we have Marajah sitting in front. <laughs> oh, we have Aitullahs, yes. <clears throat> I've been forgetting to do that.